can repeat. I'm Bentley, Dallas, Texas, the area um, coming from. Uh, and today I'm really tired, so I'm not sure my participations will be really high, but if I think I can provide some value, I will pop up. Um, but I enjoy doing uh, software development. So I'm another one of those people who software is the hammer. And so that's how I fix everything, um, which is not necessarily the right way. Um, but here to support everyone with tech if you need it. Awesome. And, and I think we'll be getting to that place where it'll be super useful a skill. Thank you. Uh, Pete, then Max, then Hank. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm from San Diego. And uh, it's going to be another gorgeous day here. Um, I noticed uh, some of my alert systems say that we've got uh, medium, small earthquakes happening in Los Angeles, which is kind of interesting. Um, high threes and maybe low fours. Um, but the interesting thing is they're, they're multiple. Um, super excited about the new uh, discourse forum. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a little bit to adapt to it, uh, but I'm, I'm excited to see how that, how that grows. Um, this is the first discourse forum I've helped um, uh, to sysadmin. So, um, uh, so I'm always I always love uh, learning curves, uh, and discourse looks like a nice meaty um, forum. So, uh, lots of you know, there's lots of uh, lots of place for us to discuss things. Um, so, looking forward to it. Please don't uh, hesitate to ping me if I can help. Um, with the farm or anything else. Cheers. Cool. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Max, Hank, then Nancy. Hi, everybody. First time on the call. Um, and uh, had met with, with Pete um, on uh, some organizing in the Francesco economy space, kind of cooperative solidarity economy meets kind of systems thinking mapping breakout group there. Um, I'm in Colorado right now. I'm in the, uh, on the property I grew up on in Western Colorado in a little town called Hotchkiss and I'm under the dappled shade of a tree. Um, it's an actual tree. I mean, we're all kind of in awe. It's a, yeah, it's a real tree here. There you go. <laughs> or it's a very interactive, highly sophisticated virtual background. Exactly. <laughs> Both. Love that. Um, Hank, then Nancy. Yeah, everyone just checking in from Providence, Rhode Island. It is actually a beautiful day here. Um, quite humid though. I ran a couple miles this morning and was pouring sweat after like maybe a quarter mile. So um, uh, been, a, been a tough one on that front, but I'm not complaining by any means. Um, have been, uh, you know, um, met with a couple of people just that I've met through this call over the week, been doing some, some little research on, on everybody, which has been fun. Um, and most recently, Jerry, as you know, I've been kind of look, I was digging into that, the, the discourse, you know, user, user guide last night, which is, which is quite meaty. And, and, um, I'm just going to go ahead and say, like, I'm pretty excited to have a place to, just join up and have some of the conversations that have been bouncing around through email. It's going to be nice for, for all those places to have a home. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been looking at some other things or some other platforms that, that do the same, uh, you know, similar things. And, and I've found that they're, um, they're very easy to kind of bounce around in. Um, so I'm pumped and thank you, Jerry and Pete for setting that up. So. Yeah. Um, thank Pete. He, he did all, all the lifting and all the coding and all the setup and, and all that's great. Um, uh, Nancy, then Matt, then Cappuccini. So, Pete, you must feel the earth move under your feet. <laughs> uh, I'm Nancy, uh, calling in from the Swinomish lands on the Salish Sea up in Washington on the coast, well, the, the, the inner coast. And um, an interesting thing, I met an interesting person this week by attending a little intro webinar she did. It's a woman who's looking to introduce anti-racism into how people interact online, particularly within the teaching and learning sphere and she's a young woman full of energy and was a great teacher so i was grateful for that that is lovely uh, and nancy have you been on any or multiple discourse sites because you're online you're yeah uh adult. it's been a while but um yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of a lot of uh the kind of un 
or you know the people working on the fringes of ed tech use it a lot and I'll, mm. I have a lot of those friends mm. <laughs> cool um matt then cappuccino then charles and yeah. matt you are surrounded yeah i have i have my crew these are the, the jeff and carol and carney um uh, really good friends of mine we're actually on wampano land on uh martha's vineyard um uh right and uh a kind of a small pond that goes out to the ocean. It's absolutely beautiful and feel really uh, privileged to be in this, um, in this space. But, you know, we've been talking about um, uh, memory legacy. And Jerry, it was, you were, you've often brought memory into this conversation, but this idea that memory legacy is, this, is a connection between the past, the present, and the future. Um, so uh, we've been talking about that. We've also been talking about um, the role that play has in um, allowing us to uh, move through interesting and difficult times um, as a, you know, as almost like a healing strategy versus or a, you know, a transition strategy versus just something that you do, you know, to distract yourself from the world. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if Jeff or Carolyn, you guys want to say anything. Please jump in. We've been, we've been thinking together for what, 24 hours, um, so it's been really a, an intense little brain brainstorm. Hi, hi there, everyone. Um, wow, I love what's happening here. <laughs> I love what's happening here. Um, you know what? Play has really healed me, and I've we uh, pre-COVID been through some tough stuff, and um, so thinking about those times, you know, when what what moves you and what transforms you, and and how you want to share that with the world. And my background's a bit of well, it's marketing, but also um, life coaching. And so I was introduced, like talking to Matt about how play has been so transformative. And I, I'd like to get that out there more. And it opens the door for curiosity and wonder and like to pivot, but in a way that's more um, tangible in a way. Like when you hear pivot, it seems, you know, it's a business term and things and play people can, everyone can touch back to their childhood essence in those times. So, um, so that's been fun. And having Matt here, it's like a curiosity wander. You know, it's like a walking cure cabinet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, many, you know, ideas opening up. And in terms of memory too, with our, you know, we're all there with aging parents and things and, and how to, uh, and maybe rolling play into that, but how to curate and help people curate their, their legacy. Um, and, but in a way that doesn't seem heavy, in a way that's like uplifting and has that element of play and you know Matt's even used the term curiosity muse museum or like what are the five elements in your life or they could be physical things like this little you know this was made somewhere on the island but that really mean like for me a life jacket woke me up when I would talk to was speaking to Matt and Jeff because like, life jackets remind me of camp when I was young and it and it helps you float when you needed a rest but it also was playful and, and there's something life-saving in it. And, but I never thought about that before. And these wanders we have are fascinating when we can have the little pause to yeah. open ourselves up to them. So, mm -hmm. you know, it fits into the story threading conversations that we've had as well, right? Um, because we have to be able to take the thinking out of, um, you know, the private space and into things that inspire and connect with other people. Um, is there anything exactly. you want to add? I think Carolyn said everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this That's is really just, funny. This is Jeff this, just so you guys know, this is Jeff Carney and um, has been working in the financial services space um, for his life and now uh, runs a very interesting um, set of organizations up in uh, Canada um, that's competing against sort of the, the traditional banks in terms of uh, bringing uh, bringing value to the you know to the people um, and allowing them to access that financial services market so uh, more in the traditional space but I'm getting them exposed to maybe max some of your thinking as well I'm, um, I'm open I'm open love that um, and uh, Carolyn just to riff a little bit on play one of the things I, I regret about modern civilization is that I think we used to just play, learn, and work together. Like, like they were one activity and the Venn diagram was pretty much a circle. And we have managed over our lifetimes to separate, you know, learning, play, and work, and during our days to separate mm -hmm. learning, play, and work. And we've, we've separated them so much that when, you, when you're playful at work, 
uh, these days it's okay, but it, you, you know, in the fifties, like work was work and you were supposed to, it was just business it's, and so forth. So it's really dysfunctional to, to separate things that way. And I think now we're busy trying to, a little bit, some of us more than others to reintegrate those. And, and I love, I love that when I see it because getting things done that are meaningful ought to be really fun to do <laughs> and, and, and ought to educate everybody participating because we should all be learning as we do the thing. So there's no reason why those things need to be um, really separate. Um, Capuchin, then Charles, then Julian. Um, yes, I'm Capucine, and it's my first time on this call. So I'm very grateful, Jerry, for being in the group. Um, I am an artist. I'm based in Bucharest, Romania. Um, but um, my work is very research-based, and I'm also involved in a larger project, a festival that is exactly this, actually. It's about mixing play, learn, and work all together, and it's called Unfinished precisely because uh, we feel that we should never stop learning and improving and and we're trying to make a um, sort of international platform for facilitating this. Um, so I love the idea of the open global mind and I look forward to seeing everything from closer up. Thank you, that, that is Thank great. You. Um, and there's a piece of what OGM could be helpful in which is rethinking how festivals, events, work, like uh, where, you know, so we've just opened that conversation, but I think that it's a conversation that many people, you know, in this room might really enjoy and might have a lot to offer. So that's kind of where, where that is. Um, Charles, then Julian, then Judy. Hey everyone from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, Charles of Pico Lab, Collective Intelligence Collaboratory with Lauren Nignon, who's here and um, yeah, it's real summer mode over here in Switzerland, um, heading more to the lake these days, swimming uh, as, w as far away from people as possible, but it's, it's uh, lovely in that, in that sense um, to be able to do that. Um, last night, there was a wonderful conversation, the last of the scheduled ones with Tom Atlee around Polis, pol.is, it's a, it's a tool to inform uh, issues and policies and um, so and it's also connecting now with Tom's emergent model of this ecosystem of collective sense making some of you heard a little bit about um, and as I told Tom because um, he doesn't have the energy to kind of organize and, and keep that going himself um, but we would want uh, kind of people to get engaged in, in a cohort of some kind to that this into this idea of exploring collective sense making and not just Polish, but other tools and approaches. Um, so anyone get in touch um, and let's make it happen. Um, Kiko Lab is, is kind of rocking. Maybe Lauren can comment a little more on that. We, we launching a new kind of series and phase of, of operations and um, busting out with some new inventions, um, just upgrading all around. And lastly, um, this week on Metacogs, we, uh, we did something called interoperability pattern jamming. So I'll just leave it at that check <laughs> interoperability pattern jamming it, yeah we're trying to make a game out of uh, out of pattern jamming pieces of patterns proto patterns anti patterns and so forth um, as a way to to co-create and evolve uh, pattern language so I started iterating a kind of um, what I call minimum viable ontology of interoperability so it's, it's pretty meta and it wasn't for everyone, but, but uh, maybe it's for some of us here. Could be. Um, anybody who's f uh, familiar with pattern languages, raise your hand. Like half of us. I'm a, I'm a really big fan of pattern languages. I think they're really nice crisp ways of, of distilling wisdom uh, in different ways. Uh, so that sounds great. That's a, and, and Tom Atlee is a uh, genius. I mean, he's been doing wonderful things. He wrote the Tao of democracy many years ago and I will just, uh, share my brain here on Tom Attlee just for a second, just so that you can see the kinds of things that I've been stalking him about. And I have him actually under one of my favorite uh, thoughts in my brain, which is contrarians who make or made sense. <laughs> he's in Eugene, Oregon, by the way, just FYI, everyone. Wow, so close. And um, he's 73 and he's still still going, but you know, he's losing a bit of steam energy wise. Um, and again, kind of specifically energy to, to, to organize and keep like Zoom calls happening regularly. And 
so I, I'm offering some energy there. I think Robert Best who's here um, and uh, there's a couple of Kalia who's here sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think the three, between the three of us, I think we, and hopefully some of us here, maybe yourself, Jerry, as well, we can really make something happen. With the I think we can, come, we can come back and, and sort of have a deeper conversation about where this might fit and what we, how we can help, what we can do. That sounds great. Um, Julian, then Judy, then Ken. So hi, I'm Julian. I'm in Palo Alto, which is the heart of Silicon Valley. And my interest is in the mechanisms of knowledge, how you store it, describe it, describe it, store it, and manage it. So this ranges from ontological systems all the way to graph and semantic data stores. But my personal bent is that this can only be done with immersive visualization, such as VR or AR. So I'm trying to combine all of these into a cohesive approach to this basic problem of managing knowledge. I take a very interdisciplinary approach to, to problems. That sounds awesome. And I think we, there's lots of explorations we can have in, into that space. Um, thanks, Julian. Uh, Judy, then Ken, then Robert. And you're muted, Judy. Hi, Judy Benham from Minnesota. Nice sunny day today, but I'll stay muted most of the time. They're mowing the lawns outside. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm really fascinated by how we can actually start to move into the action phase on this so that we start to have impact beyond talking to ourselves in other organizations. So the development of working systems that we can introduce to other people to use, which will grow the network in a lot of different ways. I'm also on a personal journey to deepen my understanding of anti-racism and how to become a better cooperative ad sort of uh, agent of change in that direction. So if there's a breakout group on that topic, I'd be really interested in it. I guess my other passion is education, how people grow and emerge and become more complete contributing people. So that's just enough. That's enough. Judy, I love that. Um, and one of the action things I'm up to that I'd love some, uh, some help with is trying to figure out um, resources for anti-racism for white people talking to white people about this because um, you know my, two of two of the sort of taglines I have are uh, Black Lives Matter is white people's problem and Me Too is men's problem. Um, the other people are the victims. Women are the like Me Too should not be something women have to fix. <clears throat> they're they're victimized by it. So it's up to men and white men and white people to sort of sort these things out. And one of my long quests is what causes people to change or to soften up. And I think it would be really interesting to figure out how we might take action together to create media, events, exercises. I don't know what, what, how this would translate, but I, I can imagine a whole bunch of different ways we might express this um, into that, the space of anti-racism, for example, right? Um, I have so. a, a fairly intense resource around anti-racism and the stages of people moving through it from hardly aware or unaware to fully integrated. Uh, I didn't want to throw it at the group because throwing it without precedent is sort of like a, almost like a, an intrusion. Um, but if it's a topic we're interested in, I can paste it into the chat or get it to you, Jerry, for distribution. I think that um, the forum we have right now, we just need to figure out where to put it. Uh, and, uh, and there's, a, there's a, a thread I created called action, like let's do something now. And I think that we might just list a series of project ideas there and see who's interested in each of them and just go off and do something and then come back and report to the group as we go. Yeah. Um, and, and if I could just interrupt here, Jerry, I mean, yeah, some please. conversations that um, we have on our sort of um, Tuesday organizing um, call of how we're thinking about this thing, with, you know, Jerry, Hank and um, Hamilton, who sometimes can join these is how do we, um, honor the energy that goes to the do space at the same time honor the energy for people that go into sort of more maybe more of the philosophical space um, and you know do these meetings just really become a point of checking in with each other and touchstone so I think we I think you're right we're probably at a point where we need to begin to separate out some things um, and build momentum around both action but also for some people, it may be building action or momentum around, you know, framing this stuff in a more holistic, philosophical way. And I want to honor both kind of both of those, you know, both of those spaces. And, um, and probably there's a third space or a fourth space as well, which is the infrastructure and the technology. And I know people here 
have a lot of passion around that as well. And so it is about, you know, we're about ready to get that next level of organization. So just honoring that. Cool, thank you. And I think a couple of people wanted to make comments about the last thing we talked about. I, I noticed Charles, Lauren, and Capucine. So Charles? Oh, th yeah, I put in the chat actually. It was um, just in regard to the, you, you kind of made a passing comment about uh, the victims shouldn't have to fix the situation basically. And I just was um, pointing out that the conversation and, and the communication with open channels and, and kind of expression and articulation seems still really key. So there's, I, I don't know if, if it, it's too strong to say that's still a responsibility of the victims or, or something, but, but it, you know, the, the communication and conversation is, is key. I, I, so I think, I think this is a lovely deep conversation we should go into and, and there's so many crazy nuances to this that uh, it's, it's interesting and, and I think also urgent. Um, Lauren? Oh, I just wanted to go do my check-in after you because it's highly relevant to what you were talking about and addresses certain things. Perfect. Um, so Charles and I with Kiko Lab have actually been trying to work on a super practical, actionable framework for memes just like that that you were talking about. And we could use this super easy kind of Google Docs based uh, framework for organizing ourselves uh, kind of decentrally around uh, OGM and be able to go off in different directions. And it, it's, it's basically just an index, just a list uh, of um, kind of hashtags. So we organize things by idea. And so we can talk more about it later, but I'm just saying it's a super easy, simple, and it could really be powerful way of uh, organizing ourselves just based on lists and basically um, gathering resources and community around ideas mm -hmm. um, okay. just by using lists and actually um, being able to attach resources like what people are willing to give to an idea even if it's not money even if it's time or effort or some intangible thing that they don't know how anyone could use it uh, we could attach those to as a new way of fundraising. Cool. Thanks, Lauren. You're welcome. Yeah, just to tag onto that, it seems that the discourse would be well suited to help us uh, make that all happen. That's what I'm thinking. Exactly. Couple scene, did you want to jump into what we were talking about earlier? No, I was just using my desk. Oh. Your, okay, good. I have. I sort of have an auctioneer's eye, so so I'm looking for people who are trying to uh, catch all, the floor, but right. I don't always catch everybody. Uh, so let's go, uh, Robert, Neil, Susan. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm calling in from the Toronto area in Canada. And yeah, I, I like a bunch of what I've heard. I'd say there's definitely lots of my core interests and overlaps here. I, I work in open source software often and try and help to create software such as either mind mapping or, or augment, say, facilitators in, in how they uh, run group process in, in the digital world. So that these are things that I don't have all that much sort of applied uh, practice with, but I'm very interested in uh, learning more through participation and sort of helping it. Um, yeah, uh, I'll stop there. Cool. Thanks, Robert. Um, Neil, then Susan. Hi everybody, Neil Davidson. I'm uh, uh, calling in from Belgium, um, Leuven in Belgium. Um, thanks for giving me a bit of a chance to catch up. Uh, I had a bit of a nap this afternoon after watering plants until about 11 o'clock last night. Uh, Belgium's in drought and I've told people here before I'm a little bit, little bit between worlds. Uh, I left Australia in January and the count is now in that about three billion animals were killed in the bushfire season last year. Um, wow. So we're looking at pretty massive systemic collapse um, globally. We're on the cusp of ecological collapse. We're on the cusp of climate chaos. Um, so in the context of how do we self-organize uh, both at the philosophical consciousness side of things and the practical doing stuff and at the how do we help people on that journey, I'm very keen to see both what I can bring, what I can learn and different ways in which uh, we can engage to uh, you know, facilitate the healing required, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, 
you know, Me Too, those sorts of things. Because if we can't learn to collaborate soon, we're not going to have much longer to do it. So I'm still feeling my way at this point into how I can best contribute to the group. And again, need to give my apologies for not having had a chance to keep up with the email threads. Um, been tuning into various Zoom calls, leadership quest type uh, conversations, seeing how people are using uh, breakout rooms, but also um, other mechanisms for uh, bringing their knowledge and syntheses together. And I still see a lack of synthesis. I see a lot of people still bringing their bits, but I don't see much synthesis. And the synthesis, I believe, has to be in systems context. And to get highest systems context has to be coherent with what is going to bring us life. Um, and so how do we get to a set of principles, ethics that can actually enable us to keep creating conditions conducive to life, where life equals all things, not just humans. So thanks for having me here again today and I'll, I'll go silent for a while. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it, Neil. Um, <clears throat> everybody's moving around on me a little bit. So I think it was uh, Ken then Susan, or was it Susan then Ken? Doesn't really matter. Uh, would either of you like to jump in? And Susan, jump in. We, we, go ahead, Ken. I'll jump in since I can only see Susan's keyboard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, hi, Susan. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, Ken Homer from San Rafael, California. I thought I'd give you a different view of my patio today. Um, so I uh, just didn't want you to get bored with my, my real background. Um, Oh boy. Uh, first, Jerry, thank you. I'm really appreciating that you've started to include the check-ins on these calls because I really appreciate getting to hear who's here. Um, I, after Neil's comment, I just was reminded of, of I'm feeling kind of a heaviness these days. Um, I just watched some of the hearings on bar and um, I'm wondering what the hell is going on. Um, and it does feel like there's, you know, there's all this collapse and all this chaos going on around us and people are just freaking out and, and polarizing more and more. And so to add to Neil, I would say, how do we, uh, in, in bringing coherence, how do we deal with the polarization? How do we, I, I've got some people that I know who are, are intelligent people who have just taken these very hardened positions and they become really difficult to talk to. And it breaks my heart. It really, it makes me feel very, very sad. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how can Open Global Mind create a space to invite people with hardened positions to come in and, and create some space and soften around those positions and learn. Um, and that has a lot to do with the racism. And so I'll just throw in people who know me from past calls know that I, I have a somatic bent. And um, for anti-racism, My Grandmother's Hands is a fantastic book. Um, the author is a uh, uh, somatic therapist, and he includes a bunch of exercises for going within and working on very much what I've done in the past of identifying your triggers, wanting to unhook them, and creating a space so that you don't get triggered and start acting out of reactivity, but can stay present in a difficult conversation around race. Um, so I want to just recommend that. Um, and, and, and Ken, you just said what I was going to say, roughly, which is... Um, and I was going to maybe add a little decoration to it, which is one of the central purposes of Open Global Mind is the thing you just described. How can we bridge the cultural divides? How can we um, stop destroying ourselves through argument, through, through not figuring out how to collaborate? And if we, can, if we can have breakthroughs on those things, and if anybody wants to elevate projects to action items, like things we could do tomorrow to, to try that out in different ways, I think experimenting with it is, is huge. That would be great. Um, so that's top center for what we're trying to get done here. And I'll just say one last thing, which is, <clears throat> Abby, I love seeing your cat. What a beautiful animal. It's so nice to see another creature <laughs> as humans. Uh, Su Susan, do you want to jump in? Then Abigail, then Scott? And you're muted, Susan. There should be like a speech, you know, speech you response. Know, right. You mute button. I thought I had unmuted myself <laughs> for once. I you did that when you were younger. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Much younger. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Susan Stuckey. I'm in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I know a few of you, but i um, looking forward to hearing what everybody has to offer here. I, uh, I have a, a longstanding interest. In, well, 
two pieces of my life threads have come back together. One of them is that I, I started out life, uh, professional life as a, as a uh, PhD in linguistics and with AI and cognitive science postdocs thrown in. And then I went off to um, change the world. Um, and, uh, and recently I came back to a topic <clears throat> which, which I think is important to the, what we're having here, which is uh, the subject of human conversation and how it works. And looking at and, and looking at it in quite fine-grained detail, um, both uh, both in terms of new research. Um, I'm not doing the research myself anymore, but I'm I'm collecting. <laughs> so new research on on conversation that uh, shows that there are more more things in common across languages than we might ever have supposed, and it may not be about about language at all. But the second thing is that um, the looking into this and seeing um, what kinds of tools and ways we have of, of actually bringing people together. And one of the most intriguing that I've run into recently, I introduced Jerry to, um, it's called Beyond. And, uh, and, and basically it looks like every other's, it looks like uh, the kitchen sink, which it is, but it has a very tight uh, flow. Uh, which causes certain things to happen. And I think it's one of the rare places where I've seen the, um, the amygdala and the intellect get, get uh, joined very quickly. Um, and it's working at a distance and it's working with people who've never met and uh, with people. So I'm following that. Awesome. Thank what you. is beyond? That is the, that's the name of, there is a, a beyond organization. It started out as Beyond Leadership, which I was part of a group where that was being, we were trying to move our thinking. Um, it's, it's a protocol. I call it an interaction protocol until my, one of my, my colleagues, who was one of the founders, said, I looked that up online, there isn't such a thing. I said, I know. <laughs> That's why I think it should be. Um, several of them. So uh, I have, uh, yeah. So it's, it's a protocol, it, it brings people together, it's very tightly scripted, um, which I usually hate. And in this case, I think it's actually um, a useful technique because people do come out feeling better and feeling like they've, feeling energized and feeling as if they've just discovered another person or another a few persons. It's a small group process with breakouts and uh, tasks for, it, it's timed. I mean, the structure that Susan's referring to is that <clears throat> each step is kind of timed and, uh, and sequenced to bring people closer together uh, in, a in a quick period of time. Thanks, Susan. Um, Abigail, then Scott. Hi, um, I'm Abigail. You can call me Abby. I am simply spoken a designer. Um, I've been living in Silicon Valley for more than 20 years. I'm originally from Europe and I spent most of my life working for Apple and Google X and Huawei and whatnot. But now I'm working on creating my own type of company. Um, I'm trying to also solve a similar problem like Jerry is trying to solve, a place for the mind. I'm specifically interested in um, creating an interface for the thinking mind that doesn't only include words, but also images, drawings. And I'm now building basically a designed language and all the components that would be necessary uh, to create basically uh, the, the software needed to um, facilitate that type of system. I'm not sure yet whether that will become another application or whatever that might be, but um, that's basically what I'm doing right now as an entrepreneur. And that's also the reason why Jerry brought me to this group. Um, whether that might be useful for um, Open Global Mind or whether I might become part of the ecosystem, that's yet to be seen. I'm very excited to meet all these amazing people. I'm also very driven by, um, you know, what's happening in the world breaks my heart. But at the same time, I see a lot of opportunity um, with all these challenges for innovation, um, I believe we have a tremendous chance to, you know, redefine what it means to be in this world today. So I'm very excited to be part of this group. And as somebody else already said, let's not only talk about it, let's get something done. 
Of that. <clears throat> Thank you. We have a, <clears throat> a friend of mine is a volleyball, beach volleyball player, like world class, uh, actually a friend of a friend. And she used to take, <clears throat> she used to mark tape on her body <clears throat> at the one meter mark and the meter and a half mark and the two meter mark because she's really tall <clears throat> to basically show because it was beach volleyball to show where the water level would be shortly. Um, mm -hmm. Some, you know, really, really small things to try to be illustrative of, of what the change is that's afoot so that people can begin to understand it. I remember uh, years ago, we used to live in, uh, right next to the Mission District in San Francisco, and somebody had painted on a street, they had painted a blue section on the street. And it turned out that that blue section corresponded to what used to be a stream that ran through that part of, uh, of the Mission District. And if you, if you went and looked at a map, you could see that there were sort of veins of water that had been just paved over and, and buried. And it was lovely just to see where water had been, right? Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes we can have projects where you do discourse and participation. Sometimes it'll be physical uh, things that somebody has done that were sort of getting the word out. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I, <clears throat> I want to let us experiment with physicality and somatic uh, things mm -hmm. as well as intellectual things and apps and God knows what. <clears throat> um, Scott and Hamilton. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm up in Interlock in Michigan in the United States. Um, this is, as you often all say, probably the best hour of my week. Um, so I guess you can consider me, I made some notes so that I could get through this quickly. I think you could consider me a curious rippler, which is a word I just made up now. I'm drawn to this because of curiosity and I hope to ripple outwards. And so what do I mean by that? I want to build um, young thinkers. So my interest in this, and I, I expressed this a couple times ago, is that I want to help make these subjects accessible to young people. Um, and, and all of you, well, not all of, but many of you work in a very technical, high-end, deep, complicated, complex, amazing space. And trying to bridge that gap and bring it down to perhaps the kids of the world, uh, systems thinking, visual literacy, all that sort of stuff. Um, a simple example is, I just had my first blog post published um, to Cabrera, Cabrera Research where I did a, um, you know, tried to model their systems approach and make it, again, something that anyone can understand, which is something that they try to do instead of making it something that's more complete and more complicated, which the world is very complicated. It has to be dealt with at that end. Well, also, how can we make it accessible to anyone at the dinner table? And, and that's kind of my interest in this whole thing. Um, one of you, Susan, you mentioned the language commonality. Um, this is a fascinating little uh, video on the evolution of the names of colors, which you can <laughs> take a look at later. And what was fascinating to me was that they all evolve the same across all cultures. They all start with black and white, then they add red, then they add either blue or green, and then they add either green or blue, or no, I'm sorry, blue, um, yellow or green, then it's either green or yellow based on which one they had, and then they move on to the others. And it's just, they, it's, it's consistent. And so I think that that might be interesting to at least Susan and, and maybe others here, if you wanna get into that. Can I just interrupt and say one thing about the, the, uh, about the about color terms in language. And I had a very vivid experience once when I was living in Africa and I commissioned a small rug, um, which was quite large, uh, red. I wanted it to be dark red, raffia, made out of raffia, braided raffia, dark red, black, and, um, and cream colored white. And I had heard, I had read, that in this, le the local language, um, in fact, the Bantu languages, mostly don't have color terms the way we have. And they have, uh, they have words for, they have hue and bright and something else. Well, so I asked for a multicolored rug, which I translated into, and I, tra and I said red, black, and white, and I translated it. Oh, I was speaking in French to them. And when I went to see it, guess what? It was multicolored. Interesting. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. They have well, the way they do colors there is um, is uh, with color like sky. Hmm. Mm. Color like this. Color like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting similes. Okay. Well, that's anyway, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the last thing is that I have a little story. I so I watched the last Open Global Mind video so I could kind of keep the thread going and talking about the racial divide and, and how we can go after that. And again, I'm not a very deep thinker on this. Um, so let me just offer this up. One of my thoughts on it is, or my initial thought is, well, make friends with somebody who doesn't look like you. And I found that that, you know, we're talking about groups versus groups or groups and groups. And to me, it always came down to the, the personal level. And, and, and I'll, I'll share a very quick story about that. Make friends with somebody who's not on your team. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, I'm a hockey player, have been for years, a hockey coach. And one of the things that I instituted, because I'm a huge fan of sportsmanship, I think you can play hard, you can play fair, and you can play so everybody wants to play again, which is kind of my little my little mantra there in, in the world of sports. And over our holiday break, people would go on vacations and it would all, you know, all the teams would kind of break apart because there weren't enough people to continue playing in our little league. And so I suggested we had something called the Goodwill game. And so over the holiday break, whoever was left around in the neighborhood would um, would be available and we'd all come together and we'd essentially throw our sticks in a pile and you pull out the sticks put them into two piles and that's the two teams and that's that's how it works and what we found is the unexpected consequence of this the benefit of it was that you sat on the bench and played with people who you normally opposed in the, in the sports arena. And over the course of the season, we would see animosity kind of well up and people would start to get, as we called it, chippy. And they'd start, you know, hacking you with the sticks and you were not checking, but you're, you're, you're being rougher than you need to be. And what we found was that anyone who was a participant in the Goodwill game they didn't have that and it managed to stay for the rest of the season because they now were playing with teammates even though they were on the other team and people who were not participating in that continued their tribal this is my team this is your team and anyway i just thought it was an interesting a different way of approaching that that i had found to be successful so i'm glad to be here <laughs> Sorry, my brain is acting slowly. I wanted to share an article from back uh, a while ago in the Atlantic <clears throat> because I, c I collect stories about what causes people to change their minds uh, or to get closer together. And this one is about the Black September organization, which um, <clears throat> are the people who, who uh, carried out the Munich uh, Olympics kidnapping, uh, which ended up quite bloody. And the short story is um, after that, Yasser Arafat started getting invited to the negotiating table <clears throat> but he had like 300 people who were sort of trained killers just waiting to go do something else like the Munich massacre. So he kind of needed to disarm them and, and neutralize his Black September organization. And what they did was they put a call out for young women in the Arab world to do something for their chairman. Basically, they had a dating service where they married off the guys in Black September, gave them a bonus if they had a kid, told them they'd get a TV and a flat or whatever. And you know, a, a, a five years later, uh, basically, they had, they had dismantled the organization and they tested the system by offering them an ambassadorship somewhere else in the world. Some of them, not all of them. And be, knowing, and everybody knew that this person was wanted in other countries. So if they left their homeland and went to the other country to be an ambassador, they would likely end up in jail. And nobody, picked, nobody took up the ambassadorship. They just, they preferred actually having a life. <clears throat> anyway, I, I, I like the story. And Scott, thanks for, I think one of the things we can do is collect up stories of what works but we need to manifest them some way in a memory, which is what I sort of get to do in, in this brain thing, which motivates me to be here. <clears throat> so Hamilton, I think. Um, I, well, can I, can Go I, ahead, Scott. I'm gonna put one more link in the, in the chat. It's a one minute video. I don't know 
how that fits in our context. Because if I shared it, you wouldn't be able to all see it at the same time. But it was an example of one of the coaches that I worked with. And we were trying to bridge gaps. And after 20 years, he gets a random post on Facebook that is it's one minute long that was basically a testimony to that sort of uh, I don't know the the sort of thinking that I was uh, that I was talking about. So you can watch it later. Um, but it was, I thought it was just a perfect example of the outcome, the potential outcome when mm -hmm. you actually are successful in um, in bridging those gaps. So awesome. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I will follow the link and not watch it now. Um, Hamilton, are you are still still on? I'm here. Yes, there yeah. you are. Sorry, Good. Cool. I had my and I'm having network issue today so i apologize um and i apologize i was late i was on a call with two fellow ogmers uh peter van and ann pendleton uh and it's so funny it's like we could have just carried our conversation into this one ours was around um you know ann's book work with john seely brown and design unbound around designing for emergence and creating agency in a whitewater world seeing the world as a whitewater world and and she talks a lot about how actually using that the, the environment is an agent in our decisions. And if we if we don't look at it that way, that we're just working against it and doomed to failure, um, which is interesting. Uh, she talks a lot about um, we're talking about sensing and, you know, for her that the normal, you know, everyone in business can do sensing, sense making and reasoning. That's sort of the the how it goes now. And she says what the next evolution for us is sense breaking and imagining what isn't, right? And this is a lot of what we're talking about here is not only sense-making, but sense-breaking and, and seeing what isn't. And she talks about pragmatic imagination, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and she talks about imagination as a muscle that can be built, which I think is also really interesting. Uh, but the last thing she talks about when she talks about how do we actually make change is she talks about systems of action. Uh, and, you, and I heard a lot about, we need to act on this. How do we act on this? And um, I think, and Jerry, I think you may have even spoken to her about this. Uh, I think it's a very interesting model. Uh, it's very simple. It's, it's all words that we use in our lives and other models that are sort of configured this way, this idea of a system of action that I think would be really useful for OGM uh, and how we can actually make impact and, and, and move from talking and thinking into and doing and, and seeing. And I think Peter Van, Peter Van is very taken with the systems of action frameworks, and I'm not sure I've absorbed it enough to understand how to apply it to what we're doing, but it, sound, it sounds like it's in the right neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody we missed in the check-in round? Cool. Um, that's a lot of stuff. My brain is, my brain is kind of just dealing with uh, the interesting things everybody's up to. Uh, I'd love to go back and just hear um, what could we do that would feel like satisfactory action? What things could we do together from whatever you know so far about OGM and where we're headed that feel like action? Type it in the chat, raise your hand. Discord, uh, quick tour. A quick tour Discord, that sounds good. I, let, let me do that after we do a little brainstorming. The next thing I'll do is a, is a tour of the Discord uh, instance. Thank you. <clears throat> I meant to do that. Meant to do that. Um, what else could we do that would feel like the group has done something in the world? I'm not even sure how to phrase what action is because I think each of us thinks that action means maybe a slightly different thing. Are you thinking about this in th this exact meeting or over the next? Wow. Um, I'm thinking over the next uh, two years. Okay. Like, like I, I, don't, I don't mean what might we do right now you know, while we're together on the call, uh, but, but rather what projects would we be excited to undertake because they would feel like we'd be making a difference. Um, and again, what maybe even what does action mean to you? So um, when you earlier in the call when you mentioned um, the uh, people were talking about people um, kind of coming together and communicating on actually I can't remember the exact context but it, it spiked something in my mind. Uh, I was thinking that several of us do probably have uh ideas on new processes and new things to experiment with um and i know we've t you even talked about um uh you know how to you know 
taking a step to 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 dive a little deeper as a group into those things. So I think we just had a little bit of process to make that happen as a, you know, so we can kind of have those meetings on specific topics, just like we did. Um, we, we've had a few on systems thinking and some, some of the tools. So I guess I'd like to continue doing that um, and then seeing how we can bring all these new processes, ideas, and tools together. Um, and so Nancy, who just dropped off the call and I think might be back, but she has a couple of different calls that she's switching between. Um, when lockdown happened, she's an expert facilitator. <clears throat> so she started hosting some conversations in Zooms, uh, trying to use different kinds of what are called liberating structures, which is a group that she was part of, just to get everybody more knowledgeable about what those were. Uh, one of them, the one that sticks in my head, is called one, two, four, all. And what it means, uh, if you're in a group, you ask a question and you give everybody, uh, even just a little bit of time, even a minute, w just themselves, so that's the one. Then you pair people up in twos and you have them talk about the same question. Then you go to fours, then you come back into plenary. And that is just a pattern that seems to work really well. It makes for deeper conversation. People have more, uh, more and deeper connections with other participants, et cetera. So one of the things we can do is we can do that a lot and we can do that in collaboration with Tom Atley and the Polis conversation. We can do it. I mean, we know a whole bunch of people who were experts in these kinds of processes and so forth. And so we could float, hey, you know, we'll have a little announcement place on, on uh, the discourse. So anybody can go join any of these conversations and, and, maybe, um, and maybe even better report back on how it went. What was it good for? What was it not good for? And then we can curate that into our longer lasting memory of how these things work and where, you know, how to locate them and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that would also include a deep dive into some of the new processes and ideas, like an ability for someone on that Discord to not just say they'd want to attend, but here's an idea I want to play with. Who who's willing to come play with me? Exactly, um, and and I'm seeing a bunch of posts on the Google group, which are large systems thinking ideas about hey, here's here's if we, if we do this, we'll fix the world's problems, and I'm not sure OGM is going to fix the world's problems but I'd love us to amplify those people who are trying to fix the world's problems. I, I, I'd love us to figure out how do we turbocharge, how do we provide sort of nuclear fuel, how do we, um, uh, how do we let the ripples reach farther, right? Um, so that we can um, help spread peacemaking, so that we can help spread uh, hockey, where you just pull randomly who you're gonna play with next, all, all those kinds of things. If we can make those more easily available, maybe then, uh, we can temper things and, and change the world. But, but I don't know that we're going to have like the game B kind of idea or the 2% solution kind of idea, or I have a thought in my brain of promising, promising solutions for world problems, right? And I, yeah. there's, there is no lack of people with pretty brilliant ideas for how to fix the world's problems. And I'm trying to figure out how do we amplify everybody's capacity to do that? And how do we give them more memory and context so that they can remember what they agreed to last time instead of fighting it over again this time, right? Um, Jerry, maybe Abby. what would help, yes, what maybe would help is a little bit of a format, if you will. You know, the TED um, conference, for instance, had a very specific format, 20 minutes for a presentation, you know, in a conference ideas were spreading and now they have a website where you can go and download the video. And what's really nice about uh, TED at the time, obviously, um, there is a certain predictable format. I don't want to say that, you know, that should be open global mind, but a structure that allows to be a container for people to come and, um, put in their ideas. I, I, I don't want to be so sound like mechanic, but sometimes thinking for us, what could be a structure for different type of ideas? And that goes back to the patterns, um, allowing us to help people to share their ideas and thinking mm -hmm. so that we can basically use those patterns and then help propagate those ideas. I, I know I'm throwing out a lot of stuff here, but I, I think great. it Abby, could be I, kind of useful. Abby, if I could just jump in here. You're ab I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think I, again, I wanna come back and honor the fact that um, everybody has personal passions and interests and things that they're trying to solve, right? That 
that we know that the doing is an important way of experimenting with how change happens, right? And I know mm -hmm. that that's one of the things that unites us. So, you know, we have to respect that some people are going to want to go there, but where, where, where you just framed is, I think, precisely the work of OGM is this idea of how do we design the container or the environment, mm -hmm. the space that allows for um, all of these ideas to, you know, as Jerry said, be amplified, but also be connected, right? Exactly. Think about the fact that we have, you know, call it a million really valuable projects on the planet right now trying to solve some really difficult uh, problems, but, but like momentum, they're all on diff slightly different vectors. And momentum exactly. have slightly different vectors means that there's, there's a dilution of that energy that's required to go after, I think, the mm -hmm. way Neil frames some of the things that we're dealing with as a society. So our, our job is not to solve every problem. Exactly, but to capture to them. It allows mm -hmm. us to globally solve the problems that only take all of us changing mm -hmm. everything. And that's yeah, the yeah. thing we have to be thinking. And so I think we need both the experimenters who are mm -hmm. in play because they're the consumers of what we build, but we also need people who are building the, the kind of the technology of that container. And we also need people that are building the philosophies and the, and the kind of the structures and the patterns of that, that world. Yeah. And we can divide and conquer. I think that's going to be important, but I, I love mm -hmm. the way that you're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. And then we can also think of, about, you know, we need to really think about the flow because how are these ideas being um, put in by whom we need to create different types of personas, if you will. Uh, we need to think about the different types of institutions who put those ideas in there, like universities, individuals, corporations, entrepreneurs, people like you and me, moms and pops, right? That's the beauty of this place because this way we democratize it and then we think about the people who receive those ideas on the other end and how those ideas are being distributed. And then how are those ideas being recorded? Are they being recorded by video? Are they being distributed by slides? Are they being written down? Is that a combination thereof? Is there maybe some kind of Instagram kind of way? And I think by making it more concrete for us and thinking also about you know, how people are maybe more receptive to certain ideas, you know, maybe younger generations, because this is when I talk to my um, almost 60 year old daughter, she says she has a very quick way to receive information, right? She goes through TikTok, Instagram, but then when she's very interested, then she will go deep. But to be interested at the beginning, she wants to go really, really fast. And we need to be receptive to that. And that's also another thing. We need to have maybe somebody in our group who represents that younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, Neil, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Abby, and, and others for those comments. Uh, just resonating with that for me, the, uh, using some of the analogies that have come up before, I think it was um, Scott was talking about uh, being a, a rippler. Um, you're throwing the pebble in the pond and seeing who responds. I'm still dancing around this group, learning who's who, what we're doing, at what level. The framing is so critical to this. There are horizontal guilds of people that have different skills at the same level of consciousness, and there are vertical differentiations based on uh, what it is that we believe is the driving force that needs to be brought together here. And so some people are going to be happy, uh, and I've used this uh, example before, um, if you can't do anything else but vote with your feet, why would you be an admin assistant for a weapons of mass destruction manufacturer when you could be an admin assistant for somebody who's, you know, regenerative agriculture, for example? So the same role with a very, very different outcome because it's life generating. So, uh, you know, Bucky Fuller's you know, shifting from weaponry to, uh, to livingry. So there's, there's elements here in terms of the ethical uh, choices and how we help people to find that ethical compass of the sorts of things we ought to be doing with this information. Um, then there's the, the horizontal rippling that Scott was talking about. Then there's the deep dives. And that was sort of hinted at uh, there by Abby talking about how we go di uh, deep dive. How do we go to new levels and bring it back and find ourselves at a new level? And I've used the analogy of salmon leaping up a stream uh, before. 
you know, you're, you're swimming around with all your mates and then you're trying to work out where's Bill gone? You know, and, and Bill meanwhile has just arrived exhausted in another pool going, hey, I made it. And then, Who are all these people? Oh, I recognize some of these people. And so, you know, Keegan talks about, you know, five levels of consciousness. You've got Hansi, Hansi Freinecht with metamodernism. You know, how do we help the, the self organization at multiple levels of consciousness around multiple levels of these problems within the predicament? The predicament is bigger than any of the problems. We're not going to solve the predicament. We are going to potentially find better ways to be in these times, in these places, because of the stuff that we know not to do and to do. And so I'm keen to see, and uh, somebody talked about container, just referring back to the container. Glenda O. Yang um, has a model, the CDE model, container difference and exchange. The container has to be the right size. If it's too big, things are too diffuse. If it's too small, things are too constrained. If it's just right, where's the Goldilocks zone, right? Secondly, with difference, if the differences are too great, if you're having too much polarized argument, how do you bring a different level of uh, difference, you know, the, it's the difference that makes the difference. How do you bring that closer together? And the exchange being, how do you create the conditions for mutually and reciprocally beneficial exchanges? Uh, and so that CDE model to me links into this difference between agreement and certainty and different levels of agreement and certainty, depending on your capability and maturity to handle chaos, complexity through to simple order. And so I think there are ways of framing this. I haven't had a chance yet to dig in to uh, the, the OGM to see how you've currently got this structured, but different individuals are going to be coming for different things. So as a library, you know, there's things that people can come and read, how they apply it will, d will be dependent on what they think is the problem. But ultimately, if there was a way of gently steering that towards ways of being life generating rather than just for personal benefit. Um, that would be a way of, I think, of having some overarching ethics, which guided you know, collective multiple actions at different levels of consciousness. And I'll finish on this, that this group already to me represents a mutually assistive community, uh, a mutually assistive community in the context that the next door neighbor might be your closest ally if you have a health problem rather than the ambulance. Um, they may not be the expert, but they might know more about it than you, and they're certainly better off than you if you're lying on the ground with a heart attack. And so how do we align people, buddy people, give people mentors that can learn from, allow people to change uh, their relationship? I'm the expert on this, but I'm very shallow on this. How do we align people to mutually learn and then bring that back? And I think that is the vertical differentiation of knowledge and consciousness, not just the horizontal variation in discipline and role. So Klaus and then me for a little bit. I'd like to put a couple of things on the table as well. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking of uh, projects and project management as a rather mechanical process. And so there, there are really two, two issues. One is, what are you trying to fix? You know, what, what is the highest uh, ambition of the project? And then how do you go about uh, facilitating that? And I'm really emphasizing facilitation here. Um, so it, I had an exchange with Torschborn. He's not here this morning, but it, he, he, really, he really sort of uh, asked interesting questions, you know, that, that structured uh, the, the conversation. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm totally focused on food systems, you know. Uh, food system is, a, is, to me, is on par, is the energy system. It's of equal importance, but it's not being recognized. It's just now coming into, into uh, awareness that the food system is actually uh, mm. far more survival focused than the energy system even is. So, so he uh, uh, proposed a couple of projects that, uh, uh, he thought uh, could be, uh, the, even, let's say, low-hanging food could be easily fixed. And so my question then was, from, so from when you put this into a project frame, right, then the first thing you want to go is explore why this project hasn't been fixed yet. Why, uh, what are the pros and cons for fixing this problem? What are the resources required to fix this problem? Do you have those resources? You know, in the scheme of things, 
if you look at uh, a multitude of projects, where would you allocate your resources is the most beneficial place. Um, so I've been doing this for a number of years now, and I'm working with, with several organizations, uh, sort of as a coach in, in uh, um, I gave up my consulting career and focused on NGOs. Uh, because they are more, they are receptive, you know, and 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 are trying to get themselves uh, organized and together, um, and and what is really missing here is a process structure uh, where they where that guides their thinking through phases of exploration, you know, from feasibility. Uh, I mean, first of all, we call it a blue sky. You know what what is out there that we could uh, we could address. Then you go into a feasibility approach, and so on and so on. And and, and until you bring it into a, a prototyping phase. Um, and I there, agree. Yeah. So there there isn't. Uh, the, I'm I'm not sure that in in a team like this we could actually do something, but we can help develop structure and guidance you know, because the knowledge base out there is so phenomenal already. I mean, everything you can ever think of, ask the question and you will find the answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's consolidation of information, consolidation of uh, structures uh, that then help guide teams forward. So let me throw a bunch of things in the conversation that I think are answers to some of the things we've been saying. Um, some of these I typed into the chat, so uh, you'll have to scroll up a little bit now because the chat's really busy, but I, I talked about five minute universities and I put a link to one of the ones that I did. And the idea here is all of our stacks of things we have to read are way, way, way too big. Like no, none of us are gonna get through. Neil just mentioned two books I haven't read and I'm starting to know Neil and I'm like, oh crap, now I gotta read those. Um, how, how might we short circuit that process for one another and for the rest of the world? So, so the five minute university I put up uh, is I posted on YouTube a couple of years ago. It's about Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation. And unfortunately it's not five minutes short, it's like eight minutes, I guess. But the goal is to take something you love, something you know a lot about and just, just talk, discuss what you got from it as quickly, as pithily as you can and just put it in the world. And I get all sorts of nifty comments on the thread on YouTube below it. I don't have a lot of conversation on YouTube, but I get really nice comments back on this one. And I've only done a couple five minute use, but we could create a format where any of us who has a work, a work that we're passionate about wants to express it in a pithy form and we could pair up and do that. We could do it as a conversation. We could do it, there's like a million, a million different formats or forms for doing this. But that, I think if we lather, rinse, repeat on that, we get through our, our, our crystallization of how the world works, I think a little, a little uh, more quickly perhaps. Then uh, second thing is I will just go here to, um, when I read a book that I really like or see a TEDx talk that I really like, um, I debrief it into my brain. And part of the reason we're here is that I've been using this thing for 22 years, but here's a really nice TEDx talk by Jason Roberts, uh, who is the founder of Better Block. Uh, and it's an exciting talk. And so here's three steps to a better block. Um, he says, give it a name that gives it life, set a date and publish it, blackmail yourself, show up. If you don't, uh, some, she will, and she hates everything. And his talk is really cute and really fun. Um, and I put three steps to a better block under enumerated wisdom, which is one of my favorite link, you know, thoughts in my entire brain. But partly what I'm saying here is I'm sitting here trying to curate the nuggets, of, the shiny nuggets of interesting things that I'm getting from everything I hit right, from every piece of media, whether it's a movie, a documentary, a TED talk, uh, a book, a really great blog post, and, 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 and then so, uh, you know, best Trump. If I just do best articles about Trump, I will, uh, I'll get it, I think I have several now, but uh, here's best articles about Trump's win, for example. So um, these are a whole bunch of articles. Here's uh, people and systems who predicted a Trump victory, and I've connected it to Michael Moore, uh, Mark Blythe, David Betras, Richard Rorty. These were all people who figured out, you know, Scott Adams, the writer of Dilbert, right? All people who figured out Trump was gonna win somehow before he won. But sharing, and, and I wish more of us were sharing the information in this fashion. And I'm not sure what that means, but, but part of what I'd love to build with you all as Open Global Mind is the capacity to do that so that we can speak to each other visually, connectedly, so that, uh, um, uh, Judy, you love to talk about hyphae and sort of the dendritic, the dendritic networks. That, that's exactly what I wish I had at hand so that as I'm busy 
sending little haifei out to meet up with other people's ideas, we're actually talking together in a medium with a medium, right? And I, I, I don't know what that thing looks like exactly. I've got, a, I've got a taste of it because I'm in this proprietary tool called the brain, but man, I'm just dying for the next tool. And I think we have the capacity to experiment our way toward that. And I think that that will offer a kind of structure. So then two other things. Um, I wrote in here roles and gills. And when we were brainstorming how to organize OGM, one of the fun things that came up was, um, hey, uh, we should sort of maybe organize ourselves around gills. And, and two, two gills uh, stand out. Um, two guilds stand out right away. Um, so um, story threaders and map whisperers, and these are just playful starting, starting point names. The story threaders we had a whole call about a couple weeks ago, which is a, a concept that's sort of like graphic facilitation, but different from. And story threading is, is uh, bringing talented people in to express the nuggets that they find in, a, in an event or a meeting and then thread a story through them using whatever their skills are. So maybe they create a graphic novel, maybe they do a documentary film series, maybe something else. Map Whisperers is actually, um, I did some work with Christina Bowen and uh, uh, several of you, Charles and, and, and Lauren, a few others. Um, and we were coming together around mappers, like people who love mapping and are skilled at using the mapping tools. And I think that would, that would be a really fun guild to start inside of OGM so that if you're a mapper and you know, I'm a black belt using the brain, but I'm terrible at most of the other tools. I'm just not, not capable. But other people in this room are really skilled at, at a whole bunch of tools. How do we work together as a guild and then go get hired for doing mapping in different ways for companies? Because there's a total business here. Like there's no reason this is not a business. Same thing for story threaders. That's a role that companies should be paying for as story threaders go in and do their work. So guilds can actually be sort of like guilds without the restraint of trade and the, the horrible practices that some guilds engaged in back in the age of guilds. But the nice thing about guilds is that um, uh, advanced members in guilds are, are meant to protect and bring up and treat and teach the younger members of guilds. So for example, how do map whisperers bring young people in who are like, I'm all excited about visualization. Okay, great. We, we have a process where you can see what the set of tools are. We have skills building, we have whatever else. And the, the guild is kind of in charge of that. And then on roles, roles are not the same as guilds. Um, the one role that really stands out to me is the role of builder. <clears throat> because some of us in OGM um, just want to make things. We love getting things done. We're either good at project management or coding or whatever. And we don't have a strong feeling for what the visualization should look like or uh, you know, uh, what kind of ontology to use. That, that's not our thing. But our thing is making stuff. And we'd like to make stuff that's meaningful and that serves some interesting higher purpose. And I think we have an opportunity here to connect builders to projects. And how we do that is, is, is interesting. I, I created a website in the old Google sites. I created a website for something I called Rex Lab, which had this process. And I can, maybe on a, on, a, on a future call, I can give people a guided tour, or I could record one on video and just pass it to the list. But Rex Lab had kind of, I called it a, a hiring hall for uh, the next millennium, where people would come in, members of guilds or something like that, and then projects would float up on the big board. And you could go talk to the people who were in the projects and there was a definition of what is a project and there were stages. Each project might have its own different business model, a whole bunch of stuff that I think would make Klaus and Abby happy. Um, because, because I think it would smell like that some piece of what you're looking for, for structure for how do we, what is a project? How do we, how do we organize it and structure it? So I could go back and pick up some of those pieces or we could reinvent it here uh, in different ways. And then the last thing is, and we're getting close to the end of our call, I should give everybody a really quick guided tour of the forum, of the discourse uh, board that Pete uh, set up, uh, just so that um, everybody's kind of seen it. I sent an email invite to the OGM list last, late last night. If you follow that link, um, and if somebody wants to find that and put the, put the link in here. Uh, Charles, I haven't done the video of RexLab yet, uh, but I can invite you into RexLab to look around to the Google site, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, I'll post the link uh, to the OGM list if anybody wants to come look at it. Uh, and it's sort of, it's a composite of spreadsheets and descriptions and pages and it's, eh, it, it's sort of work, but I never really jumped in and started using it. Um, Neil, go ahead. Just uh, one, one quick addition to your story threaders and map whispers. And I also heard you mention Christina Bowen, so I'd like to touch base with you about how to reconnect with her. I haven't seen her for a few years. Um, oh, cool. The, um, one of the things I was playing with was the term called keynote listening as opposed to keynote speaking. And so one of the issues of turning this into action, and this is something that I can do in real time, is with a real group, can sense into and feel 
uh, when there's the aha moment and how to join the differences in the room. Uh, and in real communities, that's critical to whatever is that they think is the biggest issue that needs to be solved. Having multiple roles, and I love the role you play here, Jerry is uh, moderator, mediator, um, you know, the holder of the brain, um, the curator, and so on. And you're playing part of this role of keynote listener. But the keynote listener's role is to lift the collective understanding to a new level than what started, what it started at, by injecting or dropping in a card at the right moment, throwing another pebble in the pond, disrupting coherence compassionately, finding ways of gently shaking up, not breaking the pattern, but shaking up the pattern a little bit so things can go, oh, hang on, I hadn't seen it that way. The, the role of the keynote listener, uh, and this is something that's evolving for me, is to sense into how come there's two or three or four different perspectives in the room and how do I get them to see each other and themselves in this emerging systems context? And so it's something that's very hard to, to get paid for yet. Uh, I, I have gate crashed conferences and had <gasps> applause from the audience. Um, and this frustrates then of course, the gatekeepers and the institution holders who think they're already doing it. And so I think this is tapping into the emergent wisdom that is crying out for leadership, which is coming from a different level of flow than what is being allowed by the structure. So you need the structure and to be able to dance around it. And you need people that can both thread the story of what's just been done, but also to sense into what wants to be born, to be able to throw it in there without attachment to outcome, to see what comes up next, to be able to hold the explosion in the container and then gently put it back together again in a way that everybody goes, how the hell did we get here? Wow, aren't we amazing? And so, they have to recognize that we just did that. And that is the collective wisdom, which I believe is inherent in almost every group I go into, provided the gatekeepers don't prevent it. Bing. Um, so <laughs> I have been in the situation you just described several times and I'm a reasonably competent facilitator, but I was tapped out on skills. I was like, oh crap, I know that there's a moment here and I didn't know how to intervene to catalyze the moment, to take it through a process like you were just describing. And I actually searched around the inner tubes. I was like, what would I take? You know, what, whose course would I take? Uh, and there's, there's a couple interesting, interesting groups out there that are doing group facilitation and a bunch of other things. But I, I ended up not going to anything because I really couldn't find out where, where to level up in that way. So I think, I think I'm completely on board with what you're saying. Um, hey, Jerry, go just, for it, Matt. You know, just to jump in here, you know, one of the things that I like to do, and you guys have kind of known is I like to build, you know, build models of, of things, right? And Neil, this is, this is a little bit, and, and I'd love to build this out and also to continue to think at the framework and philosophy level of this stuff. These are just ways of expressing, but this, this is what you're talking about, right? As a facilitator, how do you frame something? How do you create the structure on the edges? How do you then focus the energy in the work? What information do you bring in? How do you ask really good questions how do you acknowledge people in a way that invites their voice in, confirm your understanding, help to clarify those, you know, that understanding to connect then disparate pieces of information into higher systems where you then synthesize them into those elevated places. And, and I think that there are techniques that I've, when I've watched great facilitators and learned from other facilitators, because this is kind of what we do to, to, to learn these skills. And I think, um, you know, creating these universities where there's a new generation of people that are learning a new type of skill, which is really about this integration of lots of disparate points in, in the system thinking um, skills. I think that's where we need to go. So I will, I'll record something on this just so you can see how, where I'm at. It's, you know, again, it's one, you know, one person's experience, but I'm, that's why I believe that we have to get into the do space. We also have to get into to you know, kind of the philosophy space, and we have to we have to build this container, um, and and so there's a lot of work to do on a lot of levels, and I think everyone has room, you know, you know, in this. But um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about where this conversation's going. Um, Klaus, then me to do a quick tour of the discourse forum. Yeah, just just a. Um word of caution so I, my, my experience with the systems design was in a project with Gene actually on Kumo 
um, and we developed uh, a, a, a systems map of what is what constitutes a local food system. And I found myself completely overwhelmed, even trying to get into the software, you know, because I'm really working at the edge of my capacity. And so, but in that meeting was a, a guy, Brian, who, uh, uh, who was phenomenal on the software, Kumo. And he ended up modeling something that actually pushed the software beyond what it had been able to do before. Um, but my role really was subject matter expert and giving uh, 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 input in, in responding to these questions. So it is a little bit intimidating to think that you have to pick up yet another skill and, and uh, because I mean, obviously everyone here has worked for years on these things. You don't just pick that up and, and do anything meaningful with it. So, well, I, th I think if we get, if we can get guilds full of people who are really good at map whispering, make believe that that's a term, then you don't have to become an expert in it. You are the, con you know, the domain expert and you pair up with somebody who's really good at drawing the, the maps. And, and, and if we're really, really lucky, then the maps are more public than they would be. They're not a private project, but they're out in the world and they become objects that people talk about instead of just infographics or whatever, right? That, that, we, that we actually start to debate, negotiate, improve systems diagrams of how things are working. And we, we, we float queries. We use, we use those, di those diagrams um, as part of our inquiry into how to fix things. That would be a, a lovely thing. And I agree that most of these are just way too complicated. Once you see the pie as it got baked, it's like, wow, pretty overwhelming. And Gene is really good at sort of opening it up step by step so that you see first this, then this, then you add this, <clears throat> then the, bells, the bell goes over here. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, I'm kind of grooving with this. Uh, so uh, we have lots to talk about on this. Let me do a really quick screen share to take us into the forum, just so you can see what categories I set up at the beginning, just to start with. So basically, um, there's an introductions bin. And uh, so far, uh, Stephen Kreutzer is, I think, the only person who's sort of logged in and gone and posted a couple of things, which is great. So uh, that's Pete and that's me uh, just messing with the system. Uh, but there's an introductions thread. Uh, let me just go to it. Um, and uh, da -da -da -da. Here's, here is what he wrote. Oops, it's up here. There we go. So I had posed a, a question in the intro basically in the, in the introduction section to the introductions thread, I said, where are you? What is your main gig? Uh, can you share your LinkedIn link? And he basically went through and answered all the questions beautifully uh, and kind of took us already into uh, having introductions. So let me, let me then go back up to the main uh, menu because I just want to point to what these things are. Um, the sandbox is just a sort of a place of moratorium where if you don't know where to put something, put it here. Uh, it's meant to be sort of playful, but it's meant to be uh, if, no, if none of these other things make sense, go here. If you need help figuring out your way around, go to help and ask your question. And then there's kind of a, a three big, big buckets here. Designing the system, bringing OGM out to the world, and big questions. Designing the system is the tools for visualization, uh, debate, discourse, bridging the cultural divide. Uh, how might we create business models? What does it mean for a business to hire us to do something? Uh, what do we call this thing? What does it look like? Branding. Uh, and then meta is <clears throat> more about, uh, about the structure of these systems and how, you know, how do we build what we're building. Uh, build, bringing OGM to the world is uh, the, the one I mentioned before, action doing things now is a thread basically for, um, and, and we can go from this conversation, I think we have a couple of things we can start posting to action doing things now. Onboarding is what, uh, how do we help people just fresh into OGM, find their way to um, the places where they would like to learn more and contribute and meet people. And then outreach is different. Outreach is um, I'm envisioning that OGM uh, over time and probably pretty quickly starts connecting itself to OGM uh, neighbor communities. Um, and I have a thought of course in my brain where I've been collecting up OGM neighbor communities, which are, you know, Demos Helsinki, uh, Deep Adaptation, uh, Fiskit, uh, Free and Libre Open uh, Knowledge, uh, collective intelligence people, that's, a, that's actually a big, big category. Here's Chico Lab, right? Chico Lab's already, already in, in the house. Um, uh, but this is basically a, a large list of communities. What does it mean to reach out to them? We don't want all their members coming into OGM. We want to build a bridge and then figure out how we can be useful to them and how they fit in the whole, I think. And I'm just starting to figure out what that means. But, but that's, a, that's an important piece of what OGM could do. 
uh, I think. And then the big questions are, you know, there's a whole bunch of enthusiasts and experts in systems thinking here. There's a bunch of people who really care deeply about the philosophy. Um, I care about redesigning everything. So I actually have a, actually I have rethinking. Uh, so for example, rethinking the social contract, I have a thought just rethinking with an ellipsis <clears throat> and then underneath it, uh, rethinking education, rethinking media, rethinking money, rethinking ownership, rethinking uh, management, all these kinds of things. So, so, and my design from trust concept is the way of rethinking these things. I'm happy to go into that more, but I created a thread for that kind of uh, conversation. And then the under big questions, you know, what aspirations do we have for OGM and for our own work? Um, uh, and I have a thought uh, in my brain, OGM affects if we succeed. Uh, if we succeed, we might help invent the next communications medium, right? Because right now we're uh, right now we're at the same stage that early movies were, where they put a, a movie camera on a tripod in front of a theater stage because everybody understood theater, uh, and then later they evolved the language of cinema that we know today, right? <clears throat> um, we're at the same stupid stage with the, all these power tools, uh, and you know instead of using power tools with each other to share memory and and, and build a collective wisdom we're sitting in little rectangles on Zoom, kind of isolated from each other, sharing links on a chat, which seems to me kind of impoverished compared to where we could be. So um, everybody's got an invite. If, if you go to the OGM list, uh, there's a, an invite that'll get you into the forum. Please sign up, jump in, go wherever you want. The idea of this high level uh, sort of major topics and subtopics is to give people a quick way to see where their topic might fit. If you think that uh, there's a topic that doesn't fit any place, uh, write it in the sandbox or somewhere else, uh, or in the uh, um, basically designing this. You can write it in meta, and then we'll put in some new topics and do whatever else. And I think that you know users basically graduate up. They start in discourse as a without a lot of power, but as they post and stuff like that, they they go up in uh, responsibility and trust levels, kind of. So. I, I don't really know how to use discourse that well yet, but I will stop because we are a minute from 90 minutes and I'd love to um, to stop, but I'd also love to hear what anybody thinks. Does that smell okay? Is it, um, what you think? Oh, thanks, Pete. There's the, link. Uh, there's the link to um, the discourse uh, and basically just sign in. We've set it for the first week or so, we've set it so that anybody clicking on create, create a, uh, an, an account can just do that. Probably later, uh, we will make it so that sysadmins have to approve anybody coming into the, into the group. But right now, it's just you, uh, so come on down. Charles, smells all right? Uh, and it, it's a threaded discussion board, right? It's, you've seen this technology before. This is a particularly good one. Um, but I think this will give us a lot more dimensionality to our conversations than the Google group does. What about the Google group? Is there anything to say about that, the way the threads have been sort of sprawling. And I mean, I have, I think maybe everyone or most of us have got kind of swamped with the volume and also for myself, I've, I've commented a little bit, engaged a little bit around um, the slipperiness of subject lines and things. I, I don't want to say too much now, but. No, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I, it, it's really hard to enforce thread discipline on a mailing list. It's just not everybody's familiar with, you know, uh, creating a new subject start. In fact, I think a whole bunch of people didn't know how to start a new topic on the list, which is just send an email to openglobalmind at googlegroups.com. And that's your new subject header is in fact a new topic. But I think a lot of people didn't know that. Um, so partly I wanna move much of our conversation over into discourse. Um, Pete is in favor, I think, of euthanizing the Google group. Um, I like Google groups and I kind of wanna keep it for just the high level, here's what's up. Um, and I, I'm not a great threaded discussion participant. It takes me forever to catch up with things. I, whenever I have to write thoughtful replies to things, it takes me forever and then they stack up. So, so I'm, I'm open for suggestions on what to do with all these, all these moving parts. If you don't kill it, you should make it uh, announce only or something. Yeah. This is my, my uh, opinion. Other thoughts? Kind of appreciate getting getting in my inbox, but my inbox is is kind of, in many ways, a lost cause anyway. But yeah. then, when you want to, I mean, a pedagogy group is maybe a, a kind of parallel. That's a Google forum that 
is also sometimes high volume and, and there's, it's really rich and, and it, it, it does drift from the subject lines and things. Um, I don't know who else cares as much as me or more than me about possibly about these subject line things. Um, but I think I, there's one little, little example I want to offer here if I can do it efficiently, which, which happened um, when I did try to jump in the pool and swim a little bit, which was simply in a longish thread um, you know, some people just respond to places higher up in the thread and then it cuts out a big chunk that you thought you were responding to because you read it and it was in there in the thread somewhere, but then it wasn't in the response and it just, it gets messy really quickly. So Charles, this should be fixed if we go over to discourse. It should be. Yeah. So I totally agree with you. Mailing lists are messy for any kind of deep conversation. So hopefully having a bit more structure and by the way, we could use two kinds of people for uh, the discourse uh, setup. One is a sysadmin of some sort, because right now it's Pete, me, and Hank, I think. And it would be really nice to have one or two other people who like the technical side of it in case something breaks or Pete's not available or whatever. Um, and then we also could use a couple of hosts, basically people who can welcome, route, answer some questions, uh, do a bunch of things that, that help. Uh, and, and, in, and, and in particular, given what you were just saying, Charles, uh, make sure that the, the titles and the threads are more or less consistent with what's going on in the, in the conversations. Hopefully the hosts can uh, have, hand out beverages too. That's what yes. I'm looking for. Um, Charles, by the way, the discourse uh, functionality includes uh, email. Um, so I think everybody in this initial phase gets uh, set up with uh, email digest once per day. Um, you should be able to go and we haven't played around with the email much yet, but um, uh, yeah. you should be able to keep yourself pretty well informed about what's going on with the discourse just in your inbox and then, you know, jump over when, when needed. Cool. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not like huge on always even often reading all that, but I like to have it as a kind of backup archive and it's there and it's searchable. So thanks. Cool. A, a, a little, um, a little infrastructure note too. Uh, we're running Discourse, uh, the open source version, um, and um, uh, all the all the archives are stored uh, where we can get to them. Um, I we should be able to export them or whatever. Uh, if anybody ever wanted to get a feed of the you know all of the everything, uh, we could we could arrange that so that it's not just the the intent of I think what we're doing with discourse Jerry correct me if I'm wrong is to build what's going to be a, a public um, archive not you know not a closed thing I would like OGM to be as public as we can be so make resources available to everybody else when we build something put it in public view um, all of that exactly uh, Neil go ahead I was just going to say that I'm reminded in these conversations about the difference between stocks and flows and the OGM is a, a massive stock. It's a big library. Um, and the flows, you know, how much we drip feed or irrigate into particular areas versus how much of the stream do we get flowing in a particular direction? Do we choose to jump into that stream or not? You need somebody with a different perspective that can actually be orchestrating that to some extent so that, you know, if we came and said, hey, Jerry, we're, we're deep in this, in this stream here. We can't get out. What are the best resources on? And you go, D -d 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 -d, bang, right? And then you've got this tree of potential options to come in. But I think to me, what I'm sensing is, is a differentiation here of the technical role from the curating role, from the storing role, from the flowing role, from the engaging role. And each of those is going to require a different mix and a different uh, ratio, depending on the context you're actually trying to apply it to. Is this just a philosophical discussion, in which case let's stay high level, or are we actually trying to bring this to a real live you know, situation right now to provide frontline troops in Oregon with what's going on in the streets or something? So how do we uh, orchestrate that with a sort of a, a crow's nest style function that isn't necessarily steering, but mm -hmm. is providing direction to where are the resources you need next? Because mm -hmm. you know you've got them. And at the moment, Jerry, you are the, the critical linchpin link, I sense, in knowing intuitively, oh, you need to talk to, da -da, and you've got to find this. So uh, I know, I think it was uh, Gil Friend was talking last time about there's overlapping guilds and overlapping um, networks here, and we don't know who's who and how that fits. How do we do that in a way that where the administration doesn't kill us, right. but it actually enhances what we're trying to do in flow? Right. And in my experience, 
experience mostly, if you can set up some initial ground rules and get people to come in and start setting up a, a pattern that, that a lot of these lists can be self-policing. They can sort of uh, maintain themselves a bunch and then roles will emerge that we need, right? Um, hey, it feels like we could really use somebody who's doing this kind of activity. And, or, or somebody will just show up and say, gosh, I really love doing this kind of activity. And we'll be like, awesome, you wanna make it a little bit more official or whatever. Um, and then I use stocks and flows constantly to try to illustrate for people why the brain matters. And basically my one minute riff is we're drowning in flows. Every, every tool we have is, is all only flow, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, your Facebook feed, your email, your texting, you name it. And, and, and Slack and all that are meant to sort of reduce the flow, but they kind of increase the flow because now you have a new channel to check. And with discourse, we've just given you a new channel to check and that's all flow. And if you miss something that goes by on the stream, you often don't know it even exists. Stocks, the only two good tools I've ever seen for stocks are wikis and the brain. And everything else is, is flow or doesn't really seem to work. I haven't found highly functional things. And Wikipedia, unfortunately, ate the wiki space. I think Pete and I, and maybe may, many other people on the, on the call here, were really quite certain 15 years ago that we would all be writing documents with each other in wikis. Pete, you were right. You were, you were certain that was gonna happen. I was certain that was gonna happen, right? Um, and, and we're not, we're using Google Docs basically, which, and if, if, if you added just a little wee functionality to Google Docs, you'd have a distributed wiki, but they, but they haven't, right? There's actually a, a website called You Need a Wiki, Y-N-A-W, <clears throat> that uh, absorbs your Google Docs account and turns it into more of a wiki. Um, but the problem is we don't have these static bases of, of, of shareable information and we need them. Uh, and, and, and sorry, uh, just a little to put a punctuation on the thought, my own theory of why everything is flow and nothing is stock is the copyright industries that um, basically owners of content don't want us creating stocks. They don't want us copying their stuff. They don't want us remixing it. They don't want us storing it. They don't want us serving it up to others. So every time some new technology showed up, they darkened the sky with lawyers, right? Uh, the cassette tape shows up. Ah, it's going to destroy music, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, some of you have probably heard this history. So part of the reason we were driven only to flow tools is the legal threats from, from storing and, and oversharing. Um, but, but, now, but now we have no habit of, of, of curating and sharing. Go ahead, Nick. Just add one, one little quick follow-up question, forgive me. Um, I was referring to flows as in flows of consciousness, flows of collective learning, not flows of materials just passing under the bridge. Um, when you're in the stream, you need to have an injection of the right concentration of the right stuff at the right time to make something happen. And so if that's not available, you need to be able to reach out, not go out and get it yourself because you're actually holding space for what's happening. And so you need somebody who's actually watching you in the stream and says, hey, I see your hand waving like you're doing here right now. See your hand waving, here's a, a perfect resource. You drop it in front of me in the stream, I swim to it and go, thank God. And I go, hey, look what Jerry just gave me, right? And just, on, I'll finish on this because I know I've been taking a lot of time. Um, Peer to Peer and uh, Michelle Bowens, I'm not sure if you're aware of, of that network and if you're connected because another massive curated wiki uh, building collaborative processes. I've been in conversation with him and he's looking for how to do similar sorts of things to what you're doing. So how do we start to coordinate these massively complicated uh, elements of detailed deep dive information in mm -hmm. ways that actually makes the differences that we know we can make if we can get them into real communities. So I have a thought called OGM test pilots, kind of like Chuck Yeager's. <clears throat> and these are people who might not want to play in here, but I would love to see if whatever we develop would be useful to them or, or make them happy or you know, give them superpower. So I have Michelle, whom I've known for a long time and I think is awesome, and his Peer to Peer Foundation Wiki all in here. Uh, so yes, totally agree with you. Uh, Pete. A uh, quick note on discourse. Uh, uh, the, the initial setup that we've got is really meant to absorb, I think, the, the Google group and give us more space to, to grow into it and converse. Um, one of the interesting discourse features is um, uh, uh, shared editing of posts. Uh, so you can make kind of a wiki, a, a wiki light um, with uh, discourse posts. I don't think we're going to start off with that, but even maybe in a few weeks, we'll kind of set it up so that we can also um, have, you know, a, a resource section um, that's shared and editable by, by folks. Um, um, 
longer term, uh, once we once we collectively get better at discourse, I can also imagine OGM helping uh, either daughter organizations or sibling organizations setting up similar discourse instances. Um, you know, same but different kind of thing. Uh, so hopefully hopefully the infrastructure work we're doing with discourse is going to be useful just for us working together. Um, and then it will also, um, we'll be able to reap some benefits in, in kind of in, enhanced functionality and, and uh, similar things for more people. Useful in the future. So one of the action things we could easily do now is we could co-author posts, we could create videos together. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Lincoln Project. I think they're just knocking it out of the park for how to get under Trump's skin. And, and maybe convert some conservatives to not vote or something. I don't know. But, but we could create media. We could do a bunch of different things like that. And we could use um, the platform to start, you know, to start authoring those. But then I've, al I've already created a Medium channel for us if we want. There's a LinkedIn group for us if we want. And those are all places where we can find more, more audience, more people, more uh, get the word out. We should wrap this call. We've been going for a really, really long time. I completely appreciate your all being here. Pete, thank you so much for, for magically uh, whipping into being this, this discourse instance. Um, uh, dive on in there, everybody, and let's uh, go in and start talking in a more organized way. And also thinking about what the future of OGM is. So thank you very much, and let's be careful out there. Awesome. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. 